Oh my goodness. Okay. Whew, it is a it has been a day. We did I literally just ran here. Where did we just come where did we come from, Miguel? Time Miguel. Uh, that was that was convincing. Hello, how are you? <laughs> so Miguel is uh, actually one of the kids helping us with the flip that we're doing in Lauder Hill. Uh, he just moved here, how long ago, from Cleveland? Last uh, week, right? Yeah. yeah. Came here for a better life for himself, has no family. They kicked him out as well. Apparently, I attract these kids. And how old are you, man? Come over here. Come say hi. Oh, this oh. is the pretty background. I want them to see the, the messiness. <laughs> like, here, my house looks organized. This, this is what I want to present to the world, right? Over there, it's the chaos that no one else needs to see. But, yeah, tell them about yourself. Um, well, I'm 19. I'm about to be 20 next month. Um, and I what brought you here from, from Cleveland? A lot of things. Um, I just want to start new out here and hopefully just, like, get a new, I don't know, just new beginnings, really, because Cleveland's a lot, and there's not really a lot of opportunity down there. So I figured that if I moved up here, there'd be more opportunity for me up here, considering the um, – my uncle had recently taught me trades, not my biological uncle, but like I call him my family really because he kind of helped me out with the place to stay a couple of times. And well, man, for like a couple of months actually, but he, were, he was working me and teaching me a bunch of things about carpentry and painting and everything like that. Um, yeah, that's me. So he actually said some really cool things, um, but it's, it's amazing how people seem to forget how hard it is to be an adult when you're starting off, right? Like when you're 19, 20 years old, it's not easy. No, uh, it's not easy. You're, you're figuring everything out. You don't know how to like, like, do you know how to, do you know how to find insurance? Do you have insurance? Uh, on a car. Ooh. Do you have a car? Back in Ohio, I do. In Ohio, you do. Yeah. Where's, where, 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 why is it in Ohio? Oh, because, well, my little sister actually, Illegal things. Okay. In trouble. Got it. So there's a lot of that. So it's a, but so tell us your, your mom is down here somewhere with a boyfriend that doesn't get along and stuff like that, right? Yeah. I'm not yeah. trying to steal your laundry. I'm sorry. I heard myself say it really quick. No, I got kicked out when I was like 17. I dropped out of high school because I had to pay rent and it was too much for me to actually go to school and pay for $500 a month to actually pay for rent because in Cleveland I was only getting paid like ten dollars an hour working like hella hours just trying to pay rent really and so you had to drive out of school to to live yeah um and then complications ended up coming up with work and I ended up switching over and not working for them and I was homeless for a little while and it's just it's it's a bit complicated scenario really. yeah. Your dad's not in your life. Right? No, I, my dad actually hasn't been in my life since I was like maybe like three or two, to be honest. The last memory I have of my dad was in jail, so I'm not really sure. But he has a place. This is what's different about Miguel. Why I really like this kid is I here I'm at the I'm at the condo, what was it? Thursday? And we are hauling crap out like we are getting all this we've already done a day before we even closed the property just getting hit out of this hoarded like abandoned condo <clears throat> and then we have to go ahead and start demo work right so i'm there with derek and my co like well, i think it was just me and my contractors at that point and we were just like hauling stuff out left right and center just getting it all out and um he comes up and he wearing a mask and whatever apparently he had seen derek at Walmart, which Derek had gone to Walmart and come back, and they recognized each other from that, which is very funny. He goes up, he's like, "Hey, do you need any help? Are you going to be doing any painting? Do you need help?" I'm like, "Well, why not?" So, uh, yes, we can do that. And so he's going to come back this weekend. Then I just went knocking the door. He kept asking, so I went over and knocked on the door. I was like, "You want to come and help?" Sure. He came on over, and uh, he's staying in a makeshift three bedroom. It's the same condo we have, which is 684 square feet. I have a one one. And they've converted that one one into a three bedroom. Yeah. So um, he's got a safe place to stay, uh, which is good. But we're going to start teaching him how to, he sent me the text, which, which made me 
so you know we're gonna help this kid. He sent me, a t after hearing what we do, and just chatting and overhearing since I was talking with Derek, he sends me a message and says, I've got $500, I can invest it in something. What do I need to do? So I had him join investor party. And oh, Pam, you're gonna kill me, girl. Woo, baby girl. So he's gonna join us in investor party and he's gonna start learning how to trade stocks tonight. So welcome to the team, buddy. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah. Are you hungry? Um, Go eat, uh, kitchen's right there. Get whatever you want. Thank you. Happy Monday, everybody. So I was just at the condo. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, were, uh, we had a donation. I'm telling you guys all this stuff so you understand like uh, what's going on, right? So that you can, I'm sharing the transparency behind a remodel. And I have not done a condo like this before. It's an opportunity, so it's a different, different process. It's definitely an investor's mindset condo. So um, the Lowe's was gonna donate carpet to us at one point and then they didn't. <laughs> so now I have to go in there and like get rid of all this like kitchen tile, hallway tile, bathroom tile. And I'm like, how the hell do you do this? You gotta get a crowbar and a hammer. And I gotta get sweaty. Ew, that is not what I do. Do you see oh, the no. here, baby? Uh -oh, oh, next no. week's gonna be interesting. Right? <laughs> I'm getting a callus. This hurts, look, I got a blister. <laughs> Oh, baby's first blister. blister. I remember my first blister. Oh. Oh. I, got, I, I got calluses from finding everything online this weekend. You know what? <laughs> yeah, you guys were kicking ass this weekend finding all the stuff for the house, weren't you? Oh, shit. I just, she was going to go for a run. I said, no, you're not. You're going to pick up some things. <laughs> She told me that you kept sending her free things from Facebook Marketplace to go pick up. What did oh, you guys find? Um, yeah, we did it. We we this house is under under a thousand dollars, an eight bedroom house. Dear I'm you, this is like amazing. I've never actually under five hundred. Well, under five hundred dollars. This yeah. is so cool. I just I was talking to her just pulling out like she had like twin beds she was putting inside and some bed frames and we have we have four just, beds four dressers um a couch a pick a whole pick couch then there's still more coming we got it we're going to work on it on friday when i'm ready. maybe we'll see this Depends is so cool doing. it is i said we should have documented this <laughs> yeah it's yeah. all the stuff we're learning so for those of you who don't know what's going on we're kicking ass right now um, so side note, Jake Lamore is coming on. He's told me he's going to be a few minutes late. We're going to talk about mindset and different things that people want to do. And I'm actually going to be getting the kids to engage. But while we're waiting, uh, I apparently have a habit of shopping in my sleep. I haven't bought anything. Well, I have bought some. I bought like one of those vibrating um, self-cleaning toothbrushes from China that came like three months later. I had moved uh, and I, I've only used it like three times because I personally don't feel like it works, but I love a good oral yeah, vibrator. It was, so it I was for his it teeth. Like, you can yeah. use it. Yeah, That's smart ass. Nice. Yeah, the oral vibrator in my kitchen, my bathroom. You haven't seen it? It's okay, I need foaming toothpaste for it. So um, anyway, so apparently I just got this in the mail and I'm gonna see what's in this and um, I don't know what this is. But it has a thank you. That's card. your that's your new underwear uh, figure. It's. I mean, it's cute. Whoa, but this is definitely not underwear. Oh. What the hell is this? Uh oh. Oh. It's it's way uh, too big for underwear. <laughs> oh, it's a mask. <laughs> shut mm -hmm. up. So this way. <laughs> yeah. For the, air, for the airplane. Yeah. And then I can be like, oh look, it's a fashion scarf. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. fancy. So says you. Yeah. This is a lot going on right now. So it's not going to be with this shirt. But, you know, then I can just go, hey, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Admit it, you love it. It's apparently made by him. Yeah. I'm so jelly. Thank you, Lila. I don't, I will give you, you a recommendation later. I think I you can need some. You need some peanut butter for that jelly, Derek. <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, Super. Extra crunchy. <laughs> I love crunchy peanut butter. Okay. Smooth. 
What is this? We bring this into the group. Right on, okay. Steph. <laughs> So uh, hello, everybody who's on Facebook Live. Thank you for coming and talking and joining us and stuff like that. We're going to get you guys participating. So um, I want to go ahead and start talking about uh, what you guys are now that some, so everybody who's on this call has now been investing in some fashion or starting their journey to investing in some fashion uh, throughout coronavirus and our time quarantining together. And I want to talk about like, so where your mindsets are. What are you doing? Where are you feeling stuck? What have you overcome? And I think it's always really good to start these conversations by saying what we're grateful for first. So let's start with, I'm going to give you guys a topic sentence and you're each going to fill it out. If you're watching on Facebook, please put it in the chat box. So the comments, we can see what it is. So your statement is, if it hadn't been for COVID, I would not have blank. If it hadn't been for COVID, I would not have blank. Do you guys hear that? Yeah. Thanks. That's something your mother needs to handle, not me. So, besides a pregnancy, what, what do you guys got? Stephanie, if it hadn't been for COVID, I wouldn't have what? If, it, if I, if it was, wait, what? If it hadn't been for COVID. If it hadn't been for COVID, I wouldn't have some of the best friendships I've ever encountered. Amen to that, girl. Amen to that. I love that. Aww. <laughs> what about you, Pamela? If it hadn't been for COVID, you wouldn't have what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't just, what is this? They all call me, right, Pamela? <laughs> I went to found all of you, really. I, I, I mean, Jacob, yes, but Derek and, and Nelson and Steph. I mean, I, I went to found all of you. I mean, I'm, I'm, it, it's just been amazing. <laughs> God, yeah, I, I would say the community as well. Like, you guys it's, are all it's, it's really been more about the community and Jacob, I cannot tell you, I mean, there were a few people yesterday with, with Jessica, I, can, can I, yeah, you have a second? I can, okay. So yesterday I was going on Marketplace at Colorado Springs, a Facebook Marketplace, trying to find all these free or low price items for us to buy. So if it was a low price item, I, before I negotiated, the first thing I said was, we're, we're trying to help homeless young adults in the community. And can you, can you do it at this price? Now, some people know, but there were a couple of people, two people who like were just so heartfelt that they added items to, to what we asked for. Um, one gentleman, he, he was, it was for a free dresser we were picking up and he was having, I guess, a hard time with people who were saying they were coming to pick up items and not showing up, even though it was free. But when he heard what we were doing, he said, oh, oh, I'll make sure it's here. Um, and I asked if he could come out to help Jessica load it up. Yes, 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 he did that. And then we found out he's a dentist. And he said, if you need some kind of work, we can, we'll make sure either we'll find out where it, we can get it for you or something like that. It was, it was just, I would, there were part, there were times yesterday I was in tears because people were just, so kind and so thankful for what you know we're trying to do for the community so um and i think that means a lot in today's times when we're not always as nice as we usually are to each other people, there are people out there that really do care and so, um, one lady she said can i friend request you so if i come up with other items i can reach out i said definitely <laughs> I think it's great. It, it, being able to be part of something that, that, make, that makes other people feel like this, it just all comes back to you, you know? It really does. That is so beautiful, Pam. Yeah. You're doing such a great job with that, too. It's something that you're taking and running with, and you're doing awesome. I, I, it, it drove me nuts that all of you weren't going to have a place to sleep. <laughs> it was well, a mean, movie in me. I needed to make sure you all had beds. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm glad we have something, which is fabulous. Now we gotta yeah. get, we'll get everything else moving. It's so cool to see how fast this is progressing. It is. I mean, the fact that we are, um, we're looking at our second location in three months, really. 
Okay, so fine. I'm looking at my. I, I'm looking at our second Sherlock Swims Foundation in nine months since I started the. I, I officially I moved in here January 15th, filed in March. So but between now and then, now I have a second. This is so cool, and what we're doing, and now we're looking at the uh, DC opportunity. Um, there, it's just it's going to take off, guys, and it wouldn't be the same without you. I wouldn't do it without you guys. It's been incredible. So. I, and also on that same note, I think it's interesting because because of COVID, people are now realizing how much they probably took their communities for granted and they weren't participating as much as they could have or would have that way they will in the first. So, um, who's Carmen? Carmen. 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 Anyway. Figure that later. Can I just uh, tell you something? Yeah, baby. You, you're freaking me out without the mustache. <laughs> this is like, excuse me. This is like, oh, man. Start, call, start calling you don't Shaggy. Don't you dare shave. Don't you dare shave, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> he had his down here, remember? He was all down here. That was all like, I was like, oh, no. uh, yeah, the Duck Dynasty isn't my thing. This I like <laughs> when it's short. <laughs> When you meet him in person, you're gonna see his hair locks are like. Oh, I can see. I can see he's his his hair has gotten even longer. Well, very cool. But you, I'm like, I'm on. I'm like, who, who is this person? Okay, I, okay. The setting is right, so it must be Jacob, right? Go ahead, Darcy. The jewelry. <laughs> I do love jewelry. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead. While Jake's just sent me a text saying he's gonna be on in just a second. He's getting off a podcast with the Justice Brothers. So I actually want to share something with you guys. We've officially come up with our manifesto for investor party. Elise has been working her assets off on it. I thought I'd share it with you. Would you like to see it? Here we go. All right, so we're going to share our screen. Here we are. Wait, maybe it's just, I, I think there's a better one. Share screen. Here we go. So can you see this part? Yes. Okay. Do you see just the manifesto? Yes. Okay, good. Look at this. And we have our little heart. This, is, this is gorgeous. Oh, this is isn't it great? It's gorgeous. Oh, I love this. So one, bigger vision. Investor party insists that relationships are assets and real, real relationships are based on personal and business growth alike. Together, we use our skills to create vehicles of massive social change. Our community believes in giving back while moving forward. Two, thanking growth. Change in the world starts at home. We are bridging the divide between work and play. We are creating an inclusive, supportive, and diverse community. We believe that by nurturing each other in personal growth, we can help each other thrive and find that our best self is our most successful self. Our community promotes impact-driven investment strategies with passionate individuals striving daily to change the world for all of us. Find your joy, find your purpose, nurture both. Number three, co-creation and collaboration. Our visionaries turn businesses into art, prioritizing social responsibility and creating life on their own terms. We pull resources together to be more effective as a group rather than individuals. Team support is life support. Build your team, trust your team, use your team, repeat. Thanking someone is in your corner creates security, but knowing you have a community in your corner creates space for innovations. Number four, community. We unite authentic and diverse people with one common passion, to dismantle limiting beliefs. We are action takers, impact makers, unstoppable visionaries that lead others out of doubt and into full potential. We put the unity in community, standing together awakened, aligned, and connected. And number five, uncompromisable integrity. Integrity above everything. Everyone should have their chance to grow. We don't care where you come from. We invest in where you are going. Every transaction should have a win-win for all. Honor the earth, protect each other, and people before profit. What do you think, guys? 
manifesto. Yay! That took for freaking ever for us I to know, finish. Guys. Hey, Jake, how you doing, buddy? Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Jacob. I apologize for the delay. Hey, I know the Justice Brothers like to talk. That, did you like that, Donna? <laughs> Yay! Yeah. <laughs> We worked really, we, so what we did for our manifesto, for those of you who don't know, is we made like a, a survey for the people that were a part of uh, Real Estate Survivor and some other people. And they filled out these questionnaires and we had some amazing replies, amazing. So then we took those responses and we tried to like whittle them down to see like what words worked and what were the common themes. And we have an incredible community. So those are the five centralized themes that we selected. And we tried to use the words that you guys so that you guys chose to create our manifesto together. So the first one we had was like three pages long. <laughs> so we had to cut that shit down. That was too much. This is supposed to be an elevator pitch, right? So we made it into something that we put down into five key bullet points for each point for each one of our topics. And now we have it done. I think it summarizes what we're doing very, very well. So super excited. So what about you, Jay? Do you have a manifesto for yourself? Ah, uh, I'm not that fancy, dude. Manifesto? Yeah. Uh, so it's like words I'm supposed to live by or something or work on? Pretty much. Okay. What, you, what you stand for. Uh, I try, I'll tell you this, dude. I, I try to convert out of fiat into assets as much as possible. I mean, if, if I have like something that I try to do, try to get out of paper and into assets more often than not. I mean, that's something that I try to live by. Right. You know, so every, every chance I get, you know, okay, I have more USD. I, let me buy a little piece of gold. Let me buy another stock. Right. Let me go try to rotate into some more real estate. Um, it's something that I'm always trying to, to work on and live by, uh, instead of just piling up these dollars, which are devaluing right underneath our feet. So, um, that's probably so much I live by. Well, that's, that's a great strategy. I think manifest is more, it goes deeper than that. It's like, if you took investing out of the equation, what would be your purpose of living? Oh, dang. We're having those yeah, let's get heavy, boo. Told you are talking mindset today. Okay. Let's do it, Jake. Um, uh, provide value. A lot of times when I'm having an interaction, I try to provide value. So I think, I, I, like, dollars is a rep representation of it's like a scorecard of value provided to others. That's what dollars represent. So if you provide a lot more value to people, you have a lot more dollars. But even if you don't think about it monetarily, you can think about it in relationship building and just the world in general. Uh, something that I try to focus on is just how can I provide value? So like I'm in a, a conversation or you're walking down the street, you know, thinking about your skill sets, what you have on the table, how you can provide value, something that's usually in. And what skill sets do you have on the table there, Mr. Lamore? Uh, not many. Uh, I have like a, I can talk oh, English okay. barely. Um, <laughs> no, I, I can do math enough to be able to trade. Um, I, I have had the luxury of having quite a bit of time around people that are successful with money uh, and a lot of time to think to myself of how to be very efficient with money. So like when I have conversations, I had a, a consulting client, uh, two days ago, and we were just talking about efficiencies, right? Like where she's putting her capital just to just, again, it might not add a huge amount of value. Um, but like if you're in your stock portfolio, for example, little things like taking your high growth type stocks and rotating those into a um, taxable account, like say your regular individual account. Why? Because the, they're not dividend payers. The primary driver of the returns will be capital gains. It will be growth. So you'll pay long-term cap gains at the end. It's a low tax type of consequence. And take your dividend portfolios and put those in after-tax buckets, you know, like a Roth IRA, for example, you're going to have uh, quarterly, semi-annually, semi annually dividends. You don't want to pay necessarily income on that. You know, rotate that right back in. Uh, and you can add some efficiencies with what you're doing um, and, and where, where you're putting your money. So I think I can offer insights for some people, not everybody, but some in that regard. 
So what you started off as a real estate student, didn't you? Is that how you guys started? Okay. And then you went stock. So you do both. You were like one of those little like boy savants, which I love. So tell me, <laughs> so what did you like about investing in real estate that you, well, let's talk real estate first. What did you like about when you started investing in real estate? What if, well, actually, let me rephrase this question. Cause I'm trying to go for more about your mindset of behind investing, especially today and why people um, get scared and what things they have overcome specifically while doing things through Corona. So today it's very different than it was. So if, if I'm just talking about real estate today, the number one reason I like real estate is debt. Hands down, debt. To me, the advantage of real estate is debt. What other asset class out there can you get 90% LTV, 70%, 80%, 60% at 2.5%, 3.5%? Are you kidding me? You're like, that's crazy. You can control so much value with so little, it's, it's really powerful. You don't have that ability in stocks. You know, I would say number one reason is definitely the debt, um, especially because it's a debt that's paid off by other people. It's huge. And then secondly, it would be the tax, the tax code. I mean, it just, it, it, we all know it incentivizes real estate investment, rightfully so. But I, I think those are the main reasons people should have real estate, you know? How did you get started? What made you interested in investing? I uh, read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and I was studying to be an engineer, and I knew how to I, I knew how to make money, but I came to the realization that there's different skills. There's making money, and then there's keeping money. Keeping money is a different game than making money. We've all met people that have made a lot of money. You win the lottery, you do a, whatever. You know, you get a, a nice payday, but you don't know what to do with it afterwards. I, I realized I was ignorant in the what happens next. Okay, I get out of school, I can make 70 a year, but what, what now? Okay, do you just constantly have to go to work forever to keep getting 70 to, to live? You know, I did not know the now what type of situation. Okay, now you take some of your capital and you move it into cash flowing assets. What were those? What does that mean? I had no idea. So I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He talked about real estate. So I was like, all right, cool. I guess real estate's the answer. I went to a real estate class. They said, oh, it's definitely the answer. They got me all jazzed and excited. I was like, all right, cool. Real estate is definitely the answer. And I ran into real estate, you know, and uh, that was cool. And then I went to a stock class and then they're like, oh, you think real estate's the answer? Just wait, stock's the answer. I was like, oh my gosh, stock's the answer? And they got me all excited and jazzed about that one. And I started kind of going with that. And what's funny is that the longer you play the game, you realize it's all the same game. I mean, there, there's very, I, I would say there's far less differences than there are similarities. You, like stock trading versus flipping. And to me, it's the same game. The mechanics are different. Sure. It's like a, a gas engine versus a diesel. I understand that they're built slightly different and they function differently, but it, they're both engines that get you from point A to point B and they both take a form of fuel and they like, it's very, very similar. Uh, so once you start playing it, I think you start realizing it's all just a game and you then start asking yourself, well, at this moment in time, where is the best place to put my coins or my digital tokens in the game which is money at this moment in time i mean i i think there's times where real estate outperforms there's times that stocks outperform there's times that cryptocurrency outperformed i'll go back to 2017 there are times that gold will outperform and it's your ability to move in between markets uh efficiently and effectively just to take advantage of the different opportunities that come up is i think your job as an investor it's not getting married to an asset class, like saying, I am a blank investor. Nah, you, you're, just, you're just an investor. <laughs> you, you, you buy low, you sell high, right? Yeah, that's it. And you go to where the best deals are. You know, like this year with Corona, one of the best deals has been the stock market. You know, I could pick out stock after stock after stock. Tesla, for example, is kind of in the news today because their stock split happened over the weekend, you know, started trading five times more shares you had prior to Friday, as of today, it's up an extra 10%, which is bonkers, but it's gone like 11x this year. 
You know, you had two hundred thousand dollars worth of Tesla. You have two point two million right now. That's that's not bad, right? Yeah. I don't know many properties that would have grown like that. But guess what? In twenty fifteen, the stock market went sideways and made no return, and it was really horrible place to have your money. It just wasn't that year. I don't know that. So I mean, I mean that, but I guess I didn't pay attention. You, you, so it's like it's like finding the opportunities like a little swimming shark and then you're like ah got one and you get the little deal on a hook and then you you go after them and you know how to take them down sorry alexa's going off i'm trying to mute everything so you don't hear her beeping all the time like oh my dear lord we, i like i said that we have yet be fluid you know it's like you see, in our LGTBQ word world, we have like fluidity between different like letters, really. Thank God, because we're running out of them. So like, you want to be like investor fluid, right? Like not just one thing, right? You want to not, you want to be not like homo investor or hetero investor or bi investor. You want to be like fluid investor, right? Go between it all and see what you get. You might like this day, you might like that and the next day. Why not? Whatever tickles your fancy, whatever is making you happy, making your rocks off, getting making your money, that's what you want to do. I know how to do three things. Only one of which I can do legally. Uh, and that is here, um, you know, investing in real estate. And I ask about stocks. I love learning about stocks. So, and you're, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Jake's actually been helping us with Stock Market Survivor on Mondays. He's been kind of fantastic. Thank you for coming and joining us so far. What do you think of the class so far, Jake? I think it's pretty good. You know, uh, hopefully people are not feeling overwhelmed quite yet, you know, trying to make it, make people realize that the game's really simple. Like it's all it is is pattern recognition. And same thing with, with real estate markets, by the way. You notice that a, a, a neighborhood is trading at $100 a square foot, for example, and you see a property at 80 a square foot, you're like, hey, I know it's the pattern is a hundred a square foot in this neighborhood. That one's at 80. It should be a hundred deal, right? In the stock market's a little different. You see a little chart and there's an up move and then a down move and up move and a down move. And you're like, Hmm, I think it might go up again. Right. And then it starts to go up. You have that confirmation that says, Hey, what you think is happening is actually happening. And then you just ride part of the wave, however much it gives you. And, it's no different than like uh, when, whenever you buy a new car, I know everybody's had this type of feeling. You acquire a new car, it doesn't need to be new, right? But used car, a nice used car. Uh, you drive it home and it seems like everybody the same day bought the same car. Same color too, same model, the same everything. And it's not because everybody did that, it's because your brain is recognizing a pattern. You, you are now able to identify what was already always there it's just you know to trigger on it so investing and trading is the same thing you look at a particular market and you you identify those patterns and you strike and you can make some money that's it you know now some people you know they like one asset class more than others you know real estate has a people side of the business uh because it's still very i mean relationship intensive it's emotional purchases and and sales for a lot of homeowners uh so there's that type of component there's a lot of other people involved your contractors your real estate agents you know your title companies your closing agents so there's a few more people involved so people who are naturally maybe more outgoing they crave social interaction maybe they like that part of the asset class fair i get that I'm naturally introverted. So for me to stare at a computer screen and talk to zero people all day and make money, that's beautiful. That's all you need in this world. Uber Eats gives you your food. Amazon delivers the rest. And you could just hibernate and chill wherever you are without needing people. So that appeals to me, right? So I think some people might find pieces of asset classes appealing, uh, but it's all, it's all the same game at the end of the day, everything. So you consider yourself an introvert? I'm a trained, I'm, I'm an introvert trained to be extroverted. I've, uh -huh. I've gone through enough self-development to know how to be a public speaker, to know how to have customer service skill set, and to know how to present and communicate ideas because it's very difficult in this world if you can't communicate. That's, 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 that's tough. 
I mean, in, if you want anything in this world, you want love, you want a, a, investors to invest in your properties, right? You need to be able to communicate, right? It, it could be the best deal in the world, but if you can't tell people about it, it doesn't matter. So I, it's been something that I've had to work on. That was my own journey because I, I always struggled with that personally. So that's why, you know, trading kind of appealed to me. Again, the idea of just being in a more uh, natural place, I'd say, where I don't have to be uh, like talking to people and I can do my thing. That's cool. Um, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't be in the other places, especially when real estate's one of the best deals out there. Um, for tax-wise, debt-wise, no-brainer have to be in it i mean i happen to agree with you i love socks as well but i like people and honestly if i'm not around people for a while i get really depressed like i definitely need i'm more of a people person this whole thing with current is rather challenging okay it is raining here they've got this alexa timer going on the kids have like their speakers talking on stuff i'm about to pull my hair out and i have spent a long time keeping this shit in so forgive me for whatever is going on I'm going to try to not lose my nonsense over here. So that's what happened to your mustache. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <clears throat> I like that. Whatever. Hey, so Jake, speaking of mindset, like we were on mindset today. So you was talking the other day in, in Stock Survivor how our mindsets really – change that can change the market like just by taking action within a set amount of boundaries how if everybody's acting on those boundaries then really we are we're making shit happen we do so i was just on a podcast before i came out of here um with uh some boys um uh, matt and tim justice and it was the topic was cryptocurrency we're having a whole conversation on the idea of crypto. And it's funny that you say that because markets are, in, in many regards, a constant series of self-fulfilling prophecies, right? And you can pick the asset class in question and it's just true. Like for example, why does gold have value? People will say a lot of things. They'll say, hey, it comes from outer space. Hey, there's a finite amount, you know? It's, it takes resources to pull it out of the ground. So you have to spend capital in order to acquire, therefore has value. No, it's valuable because we think it's valuable. You know, there's no such thing as intrinsic value in my belief sets, even in real estate, right? I learned this traveling all across the country, a three bedroom, two bath, 1200 square foot starter home in downtown San Fran uh, uh, is probably a couple million, right? That same house in Detroit, is worth like 20 grand. It's the same sticks and bricks and glue that holds it all together. You know, it's just, we all believe that San Francisco is a nicer place to be than Detroit. Now, inherently it is, I understand that, you know, I, I would say so, at least I'd agree with that belief, but value is something that we all just agree upon, right? For example, Bitcoin, Bitcoin was an idea, right? We all de determined that, hey, it has some merit, we all start buying it. And then what starts to happen is people say, hey, look, I was right. Look, it went up. I was right. And then other people say, he was right. Look at that. He was right. Maybe I, I, I need to be a part of this. And then they buy, which increases demand, which makes everybody more right. And then the whole world's looking at it like, oh, man, I'm real salty that I didn't, I wasn't part of this, right? You know, now we're, right. we're probably in it. Same thing's happening in the stock market right now. Give you an example. So we were falling in coronavirus, right? S&P fell like 33, 34% market crashing. We entered a technical bear market. So a lot of people throw terms around, but a bear market by definition is a 20% retracement in price. You get cut by a fifth, right? Now, what started happening were a few people said, hey, this is a great buy the dip moment. Some people believed that, others didn't. Half of the world felt like the whole world was collapsing. And at the end of the day, it's just the start of the whole apocalypse to come. But what started happening is price started running up. And then the people on the sidelines that bought the dip, they're like, look, I'm making all this money. Ah, it was the dip. And all the people on the sidelines are like, oh, geez, maybe that was the dip. Right. And then they start thinking to themselves, oh, I, I can't, I can't miss out on all this. Right. Let me start putting a little bit of money in. And then it starts to run more. 
And then they're like, oh, it really was the dip. And then we start breaking out of all time highs and the S&P and the NASDAQ and everything starts screaming. And then now we say that for sure was the dip. Now everything's hitting highs, you know, and now we're into maybe the next bull market. And typically bear markets only happen on average about every five and a half years. And they're typically only about a 30% retracement in price, which we saw. So now the conversation is, hey, maybe we still have five years of upside in the stock market. We could go straight parabolic and start looking at S&P 4,000, 4,500, 5,000. And what starts to happen is the more that we run, the more that becomes true and the more people then have to buy. And then it just keeps feeding back into itself. Uh, it's a lot of group think. I, I think if you can, and it is true with real estate, real estate as well. Think about what's happening in real estate. I'm seeing a big trend in metros, metro areas, New York City dying. Everybody's trying to leave, right? You know, everybody's getting out. They're like, oh, we want to go somewhere else, right? It's group think. Everybody's having this similar idea. They went to their nice home in Connecticut and were able to work from home and it wasn't this taboo thing. And then they're sitting there saying, why do I need the downtown office space? I'm working from home. It works here. I like it here. This is convenient. I don't need that. And it's socially acceptable now to not need that. So everybody's having a similar idea and the market is shifting because ideas have changed. So I think if you, I, as an investor, I, one of the biggest things I try to do is, is, is understand the emotions of what I call the market and myself. They're not always in sync, by the way but I need to understand what the market is thinking, right? Where do people want to move to, right? Where do people want to go out and um, be able to, to have the ability to, uh, oh geez, what just happened? You hit something. You did okay. something. Yeah, I, all right, I apologize. It's okay. All right. Life will um, go on. Keep, yeah, life way, goes on, right? Yeah, right? No, but what am I thinking? What is the world thinking? And if you know those two things, you can position yourself effectively, right? Like, for example, gold. There's a lot of people talking right now about possible inflation. Will it happen? Will it not? I mean, we could have a whole conversation here, and I'm sure many of you guys have really great points on whether inflation, nothing, or deflation is on the horizon. And I, have, I, could, I could actually articulate arguments for each one. Now, what's going to happen? I have no idea. But what I do know is if a lot of people think inflation, they might try to buy inflation protecting asset classes, things like gold and silver, right? Which have historically protected people in those time frames. Exactly. So if I can identify how people are thinking, I can get in front of the move and trade the move and say, hey, well, I see silver is breaking out of a symmetrical triangle today. What is it up? I saw it was up about 2% earlier. Maybe similar amounts. Yeah, two point something percent right now. Uh, Palladium is an even better play for those of you actually in the markets. Um, but it's breaking out of a, of a nice price triangle, right? Here, can I share a screen? I think I can. Yes, you may. Possible, right? Yeah. Okay. There you go. Share a screen. And I mean, guys, this is uh, this is kind of the, just the way I like to to think about markets. But you can see here, even on a weekly chart, we were kind of stuck in this nice little symmetrical triangle type pattern. We had a massive expansion and, and markets. I mean, for a lot of people, when you're learning about markets, you start to realize that it's a, it's a series of sprints and not such a gradual climb. You know, asset advisors like to tell you that it's 10% a year. It's never 10% a year. It's 10% in one month and then nothing happens the next month. That's how markets work, right? It'll be like a sprint and a break. So we had a nice big sprint on a weekly bar. We ran from, I don't even know what that price is, $18 all the way up to $30. That's huge. Oh my right? God, $30, $29. Oh Jesus. I'm and then it compressed 17. for a while. If I come down into a daily chart, you can see how I can kind of zoom in here for a little bit. It started to compress and kind of coil itself and get ready for another sprint. And we're breaking out today. To me, the first target is easily $30. We'll see that in no time. If it breaks 30, I'm looking at 50. Now, why is this happening? You can make some fundamental arguments of maybe people are worried about inflation. There's the feds printing trillions of dollars. People are watching their dollars get devalued at an astronomical rate, guys. We are down dramatically in the last couple of months for those of you that don't follow the dollar. This is the dollar weighted against the basket of other currencies. We are down dramatically. 
right? From mm -hmm. 102 down to 92. You're down over 10% on the value of the buying power of your currency on an international basis over the last couple of months. Let's put that into so, another perspective. So if you were to buy something that was a dollar before, that same item today would cost a dollar ten. Exactly. Which doesn't so now, sound a lot until you start thinking of it of like hundreds of thousand dollars. So if you had a thousand dollar thing you were purchasing, now you have to pay eleven hundred. So now you're starting to feel a little bit more. So it, and it goes up higher and higher and higher. $100,000 is now $110,000. Not because it's any better, but because the value of dollars is going down, which is why when people are saying prices are going up in real estate, this is what I'm pointing out. It's not because the market is better. It's because the purchasing power of your dollar has decreased. Exactly. What we're noticing in the luxury market, which is very interesting, by the way, the luxury market being multi-million, that's actually um, the market I'm currently talking about is uh, ultra luxury, which is three million and above. Uh, what you're seeing happen is people are not accepting um, earnest money in their transactions. They are accepting collateralized assets, such as yachts, planes, boats, cars. They will take those instead of the dollar because they actually have more value. Interesting, isn't it? Stuff what do you want to see how everything's going? Like the dollar is losing. It's, it's a, if yeah. you had an asset that's losing 10% in, what day was that? That was, in that was February? March. That was March. Okay. It's been six End months. March. April, May, yeah. June, July, August. So, yeah. It's been six months. It's lost 10%. That means it's going down 20% annually for 12, if you did 12 months. Do you yeah. want to be in that trade? No. Nobody Not does. That. And the no. question then becomes, how do you protect yourself? So I, stock markets aren't really rallying super hard. It's your dollars you're getting devalued, just like real estate. So if you can understand that this is what people are worried about, you can position yourself to be in front of moves that could be profitable for you. That's it. You know, And that's what I think investors are, are there to do is just identify things. Just like I, I'm sure at, at one point in America, we were 90% agriculture back in the 1900s. And then we went all urban. Right? Everybody moved to cities. If you could have gotten in front of that wave, you would have been a gazillionaire, right? You would have bought up all the city spaces that nobody was really caring about, and then everybody moves to a city, boom, right? That's actually what um, Douglas Elliman did when he was actually alive. It was back in the early 1900s, and he actually saw the transition from agriculture into urban areas and bought up so much of the real estate in New York and started becoming the broker for New York. That's why Douglas Elliman has so much markets to share in New York City in Manhattan because of that trend that he got in front of. It was brilliant. It was a brilliant move, just to go along with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so and you know what people are looking at now, guys? Like, what are the hot markets people are looking in right now? According to uh, Redfin, their CEO had an interview. Do you know what he, uh, where he's the people are looking most now? My guess would be like a B market or a C city with a, a decent standard of living, probably in, in the, the suburbs pushing out further suburbs of this. You're not wrong. Do you know where they are specifically? If I'm buying, if I'm buying real estate for investment purposes, I'm looking at personally Cleveland, Ohio, Jacksonville, Florida, Memphis, Tennessee, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, that's where I'd be looking. God, I was in Fayetteville, Arkansas. That is a shithole. Anyway, um, so actually the place Walmart though. Anchor, yeah. dude. Anchor. Walmart. No, no, I get it. Trust me. But still, and actually Walmart's doing some interesting things to combat um, Amazon right now, which is very interesting. But what they are, um, what the markets that people are looking at most, like the most searched markets coming out of New York, LA, and other parts of the country that were, that were really hit are Boise, Idaho, Birmingham, Alabama, Charleston, South Carolina. Just saying. I like Why is that? Because they are, they, yeah. they have land, they've got space, right? So that's why they're looking at those markets and why people are looking to actually get out and they want something that's a little easier way of life, less stressful, because especially if this happens again, which if or when this happens again, you want to be able to actually go outside. Like Stephanie, can you imagine going through this a second time in New York? Um, we're fearful of that because some people don't follow, you know, the guidelines. <laughs> and we're all topped on top, of, on top of each other in buildings. Like I'm in New York City. Like I have someone literally, you know, three, like five feet from me on the other side of this wall. And then I have people above me and below me. Like I'm in a 
almost 360. I'm, I'm surrounded by people in a sense. Yeah. So, and they actually are, um, when this first came out, they actually said they were expecting this to happen again in another 10 years. So that was one of the articles that was being read. And if you follow some of the uh, books that we read, like Creature from Jekyll Island um, by J. R. Griffin, or if you read like um, the books by Jim Rickards, uh, like Aftermath and The Case for Gold and um, all of his books, uh, there are several. The Rich Dad Prophecy also talks about this. They, they do speak of this happening multiple times. And now that you have seen World War III really start off without one nuclear explosion, what do you think is going to happen next? So people are looking to prepare themselves for that, where they can actually get some security and actually have some space and have some land that they can protect, that they can build their food off of. There's a really good book out there, by the way, guys. It's called Prosper. It's by, um, hold on, Chris, Chris, John, mm, it's called Prosper. And uh, where is it? It's on my phone. I've got it here somewhere. I do this. Prosper. Martinson. Martinson. Yes. Martin, Chris Martinson. Thank you. So it, they actually have a really good book. We talked about the various, it, first of all, what I really like is to talk about the various types of wealth. And people only think, most people when they start, when they think of wealth, they just think of money. My favorite quote about that is, some people are so broke, all they have is money. I love that line. I think it puts so many things in perspective. But like, it, there are different types of wealth. There's social wealth. There is capital wealth. There's also things like having seed, land. Um, there's also having preparedness. Food is a form of wealth. Um, they have eight different types that they talk about, which I think is really fascinating. So it's a really great book if you're looking to see what it's like. They talk about a diverse portfolio being more than just stocks and real estate and gold and silver. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's one of the more interesting perspectives that I've actually got through because it, it makes you realize the value of dealing with a community. And it's funny because it was written before everything went downhill and I read it during Corona and I was like, well, this needs to change a little bit. Okay. But it's really, it's really interesting. I recommend it. Not a hard read at all. Really not a hard read. Um, so what do you, do you guys have any questions for Jake? Jake has been doing this for actually surprising along. Jake has been doing this since before he could grow pubic hair. So he's been doing it for a while. So come on and get to know him, ask him questions. I know it's only been a couple years for you, Jake. So go ahead and ask him questions. What do you guys want to know from uh, this little boy wonder over here? Carlos, Autumn. <clears throat> I, I, okay. If, if somebody has something. Is, is, go, is gold a good opportunity right now to get into? It was a year ago. It's a great question. Uh, well, dude, uh, that's like saying buying Bitcoin in 2014 was the move, dude. Chill, right? A year ago. No, we want to know about right now, right? I, I think. Oops, my hand slipped. How yeah, chill, I bro. I, I think it's a decent opportunity, right? So why don't we why don't we look at some stuff? Um, let's let me get out of this. Share my screen. Okay. All right. Let's look at a chart of gold real quick. Gold futures contract. You can see my arrow artfully drawn on the screen. Obviously means we're gonna go higher. No, I love those. Sometimes I, it's just from looking at something before. Um, I think it is. One thing that I think is happening is number one, dollars are getting devalued, assets in general are rising, right? Like you can go through the history books, a lot of people to protect against inflation, whether or not that's true. You know, deflation for me is so much scarier than inflation. I, I, I actually want inflation uh, more than anything else. But in those time periods, they will use these types of asset classes to protect themselves. Now, what I like about gold is that we don't have any headroom, right? So if I go to a long-term perspective here, last 20 years of price action on, on gold itself, right? You can see that we broke out of the all-time highs and that level is really acting as a nice support for us, right? So we kind of ran up to here, we contracted, right? And now we're coming up, we broke above, we're bouncing off of. So let me zoom in even more. I gotta get these little people heads out of the way. Give me a sec. All right. Uh, and we're starting to have that nice little bounce right there. 
I think it's an interesting opportunity and time to be looking at it. Now, what I'm finding in the market these days is that when we're breaking into all-time highs, there's no ceiling cap. Like I take, there's a lot of stocks right now, right? I mean, let's take the ones in the news today, Apple and um, Tesla, right? As soon as we're breaking out of these levels, guys, it seems like there's no cap to the upside, right? You're breaking through these head, head type ceilings and you are just running, 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 right? So I'm liking gold as a decent setup. I will say that historically speaking, there's something, and I'm sure you guys are very familiar with the gold silver ratio, the, the relative price difference between the two metals. If you take the price of gold, which right now is 1975, let me grab a calculator. I don't know if you guys will see the calculator, but take that price and you divide it by the price of silver, which is currently trading at 28. And a half, we'll say four nine. Right now, gold is trading at 69 times the value of silver. Historically speaking, it's closer to 4050. So there is a quote unquote catch up trade that might be in silver. One thing that I really like about this chart here is remember what we said before, if you could catch that, if you can break above these ceilings, those all time highs, we're really seeing no limit to the upside with how much money is being injected in the system and how much people are needing to get out of cash and get into assets. People are just buying up these assets left and right. Now, 30 is a very key level. You can see that it acted as support quite a few times back in, I'd say the old silver boom, right? It acted as a ceiling, floor, floor, ceiling for a little bit, broke above, and it was a floor again. We need to catch above that. But what I really like is you can go to some super macro charts. Let me see if I can do this. Let's go max available. In the 1980s, oh, it won't go back far enough. Oh, no, no maybe it will. Yeah. Look at the price that we got to back in 1979 on silver. It was $50. It, this is creating a super, and I can't even, the charts, I'm trying to show you too much chart all at once. I can actually do it. Give me a sec. Let's go monthly charts. This is creating a really nice possible cup and handle. For those of you that follow technical analysis um, on the price of asset classes, if I was actually doing a long-term argument on, on a metal, not only is silver an industrial metal that has good industrial uses inside of technology that is growing, there's currently a silver so shortage and because a lot of things were shut down and people need it, consumers are running through these products and we don't recycle. But on top of that, this is a very strong technical pattern called a cup and handle. So if I kind of, if you visually think about this as a cup and then this is a little handle, Typically, these types of patterns work in such a way that if you break uh, through the top of this, you typically go the distance of the depth of the cup, which means that we would be able to run, if you're going down to three, four dollars, the next price target is like a hundred after 50, right? So not, a, not only is it a potential catch-up trade from 30 to 50, if we were ever to break above 50, it's a really nice 50 to 100 is kind of my assumptions. Now, this is not an investment time horizon. I'm talking a couple of years it takes to really make moves like this. On a short time frame, what I love about this metal over gold is the speed of movement. If we go debt back down into a short time frame, guys, today we're up 2.5% and look how small that little candle is, right? It's easily going to drift from here up to 30. That's another 5% on cash if you add no leverage to the deal. A lot of people add leverage, right? On a four to one leverage, 5% is 20. It's pretty good, right? If you're just trying to trade and make a few dollars. Um, I'm a believer in the asset class. I am a holder of metals, so I'm therefore always default long. So it's easy for me to have these assumptions. I'm playing into my own personal biases. I make that abundantly clear. So I profit if it goes higher, therefore I want to see higher price, therefore I, find every reason why it should go higher. The only thing that I see as a nice headwind would be deflation. Everything unwinds. I think that to me is the only thing that would be a really strong enough headwind uh, to be able to prevent this type of move happening. You can see gold is kind of on that teeter totter mark. 
of where price is kind of meandering sideways on a daily. I, if you're a trader, if you're trying to make a quick buck, I'll give you some actual concrete advice. You break above this high, which is 1987. If you break above that, I'm a buyer. So that let's draw a line here, right? You break above that with any meaningful momentum, I'm a buyer. Add to the position when you break above this high, which is 2040 or 2024.60. So say 2025, add to your position. Uh, and then I would say first target is all time highs, 2089 or 2100, right? So you buy here, you buy here, you sell off some of this, you let the rest ride. That's a decent setup to gain some exposure if you have none in the metals market is what I would do as a play. Uh, but what I will say is position size effectively. You can't make this your whole account or what you do, right? So, I mean, any, any proper position size management strategy should be 10% of your account. You're trading 100 grand. You could put 10K into a trade like this. Leverage it as much as you want, but only put about 10K into the trade would be my thoughts. Last year, I put some of my uh, retirement account into precious metals, gold, and silver. So to put it into perspective, uh, I bought silver at $17, and today is trading at 20 what? 20, 28. 28, yeah. I mean, uh, when you divide that, I have 1.64, which means I made a 64% return on my money in one year just by having it sit in mine. It'll save. Yeah, but you're cherry picking, bro. I, I do want to say, because I've had medals for uh, years and they did I'm not saying things. this for everyone. Not, and don't they you lost money. For years, uh -huh. there was losing for you. money. Just, I haven't yet. I was sitting there but. and they were just doing nothing. And I was pissed. I was staring at the screen, like yelling, like, go, go. And it's like you're trying to be a chart whisperer. Like, I'll bribe you if you just go higher. It doesn't work. Um, I, I have the medals. I don't actually trade the stock or the futures, the ETFs. I have to just the metal coins. But I don't do it. I didn't buy it as an investment. I bought it as a way to preserve my purchasing power. Gold will buy ground. Silver will buy growth. So it'll be your daily denominations that you can buy with silver. You can go and buy groceries with. Gold will help you buy assets that are a little bit bigger. You know? So that's something to know. They don't do a lot, but it's good to have some on hand. It's also good to know about barterability. So like if you have like... Um, if you have that your grandmother's like, giant brooch with emeralds or you know some gold in there, whatever, that's also good to keep because you can barter for it. So there's barter value as well with yeah. items. Most but don't worry about liquidity. I have to say, liquidity is king, especially in times of crisis, right? So uh, how many people are going to know? Because I've looked into emeralds. Is it an actual like if it, if it's a nice like unfilled emerald or they put all the different kind of composites in the emerald, right? What grade is the emerald that has a large difference in value between those two things right you're looking at it as a way to actually sell it and make money i'm not no but I'm people about need to know it's worth something you had to leave so for example if the dollar goes completely bust inflation deflation whatever who cares all you have is what you have in your house all right let's just say that and you've got to move you got to travel you got to go somewhere right if you have this tchotchke jewelry, but I'm talking nicer jewelry that happens to be in your family for whatever reason you happen to have inherited, it is worth what the other person wants it for. So it's that barterability. The whole idea of being liquid is bullshit. It's, sorry, no, I'm not bullshit. It's, if you think just liquidity, it's not gonna help you. It's trade that's gonna be helpful. In, in Venezuela right now, they don't give a damn about liquidity. liquidity. They are bartering for services because their money means nothing. So they're taking what they have and they're trading it for food because that's the only way that they're actually getting what they need to survive. And that's what's going to be happening for a lot of this. So it's not about necessarily liquidity. Money is going to be changing and evolving. Now it's digital. Now we have digital currencies, right? Like it's constantly changing. It's but, but all currency is is what people put behind it. The, you know what the most um, stable currency that the United States has ever had within its four central banks before it actually has central banks? You guys want to guess? This is going to kill your, this is going to break your, blow your mind. You want to guess at all? Anyone? Greenbacks. What? Greenbacks. Greenbacks. Uh, you know, they were stable, but that's not what I'm going for. We're not talking soft, I'm assuming. <laughs> not soft, but you're closer on that point. Yeah, you're closer. Like coal or something? No. Uh, a little further, but still, you're on the, it was tobacco. Tobacco. Tobacco, because there was only so much of it that could be grown, so it had so much value. 
if you had too much, you could smoke it. If you didn't have that enough, you had, it went up in price. So it was, a, it was a tangible asset that people were trading back and forth, which was one of the reasons why the Civil War was so violent uh, and there was so much going on. Now, keep in mind, there was a whole lot of things going on in society that were not appropriate. Um, and I will definitely adhere to it, yes. But tobacco is being traded back and forth for such a long time. That's what had value. It was really interesting to see what that is. But the barterability is what I'm going for. It's what you put behind it makes the difference. How do you define liquidity? What is, what is, how do you define liquidity? The ability to sell something quickly for cash, for the currency of that state. Okay, ease of exit. You can get out of something. Okay. But it has right. to be worth. It has to be worth something, something. to someone, because Agreed. you might wind up in a in a position where no one wants what you have that was that was very valuable when you bought it. Right. That's a good point. So that's why we talk about seeds, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would also chime in and say that even during the Revolutionary War, right, the the South or like you know the the, the well the, the parts that were still in favor of the British occupation, they weren't accepting Union money. So how did they get their services? They were using, I have corn, and I will take you know I'll give you my X barrels of corn for your pig, so I can have food on my table. So the other way it was again a barter because they weren't accepting Union currency versus the pound because that's what it was going. Yes, Hamilton, of course, live the love of my life. <laughs> Theater, love y'all. So yeah, that's exactly it. But it's also, you know what that also made, made, makes me think of? Have you guys ever played, um, uh, what was it? Not the Prisoners of the, the Settlers of Catan. Anyone? Anybody got yeah. wood? <laughs> no? I've got some more. No, that's a good, it's a good wood. game. But I, I want to I, I wanna challenge you on this, Jacob, because I, I believe personally one of my my belief sets is liquidity is king uh from the from the standpoint of being able to trade out of things and and holding on to things with agreed upon value so i like for example a a, a, a an emerald brooch versus an american eagle gold coin most heavily circulated recognizable coin in the world mm -hmm. versus a gemstone which not everybody can actually correctly identify in terms of value is I think important in times of crisis. Because if you, even if you have $20,000 worth of stones, cause I was trying to invest in diamonds. So I ran into this issue. I was trying to buy like $15,000 of diamonds. I'm like, instead of just die, instead of gold coins, I want to have gemstones. I thought, I like how small they are. You could fit them in your shoe. If you ever needed to escape somewhere, nobody knows you have them. You have large amounts of value without needing to necessarily carry a lot of weight like my silver bars. The problem I run into is, will people understand the value when I try to trade it with them? Will they actually understand the certification, like the quality? They might say it's a hundred dollar diamond and how do I argue? Cause they don't know, they, they literally don't know. Uh, and like traded, like a, a lot of collector's items are very similar to that. One person's trash is the next person's treasure. It could be a $20,000 baseball card. I don't know that. I think it's worth two bucks, right? So I think having value stored in things that is agreed upon across the board protects you that you can easily trade out of. Because like you could have a, a collectible car collection right now. It, let's say you're leveraged to the hilt in real estate and you have a lot of debt payments because you had an Airbnb empire and you need to pay those loans, but you have a collectible car collection with one of a kinds across the board, you know, and not everybody agrees upon true value. It's going to be hard to get out. Go, Stephanie. But I would then ask you then, Jake, what happens when you have like in real estate, for example, right? Yeah. A seller insists their home is worth a million dollars. But if it's a buyer's market, the buyer determines the value of that home. Whether Agreed. he says it's a million dollars, the seller says, my home is worth a million dollars. But then the buyer comes and says, no, your house is worth half a million. I think it's worth 50% of the value you give it to. So we're still going to have that question about what something is valued, even if we have a determined, you know, because who sets that number? right? Some of those numbers are biased, right? We set some of those numbers ourselves. So it's, so yes, one man's treasure is another man's trash or vice versa. So 
I like you could tell me this diamond's worth a mil it's ten fifteen thousand dollars, but I'll say I have a diamond just like that back home, and I think it um, I know that it's worth fifty thousand dollars. So or vice, you know, whatever. So it, I think what I think is interesting is that at the end of the day, we can't really put a value on it because it always comes down to someone's biases. It can always change. There's no, we can never concrete say, like Pam was mentioning about seeds. I could say your $15,000 diamond is worth five exclusive seeds that's going to happen. That's going to be much more valuable in five, 10, 15, 20 years than your one diamond right now. But, but, Stephanie, I think it, a lot of it is the exit strategy and the what are we buying for? I mean, are we buying for legacy? Are we buying for, um, you know, my husband's a, a child of a survivor. So when, you know, when Jake says putting a diamond in, in a shoe, I mean, his family put, you know, put the stuff in the hems of the clothes. A lot of good it did. They still wound up in the same place. So the problem is, is, you know, and they tried to bribe. That was the thing. So you've got to figure out what does anybody, and, and unfortunately it's looking into the future and you really don't know the answer. So, so my, my exit thing is unfortunate part. And but I think it has to do with portability and, and, and hideability. <laughs> but also depth of market. How many people are buying diamonds versus homes? Right. So I think the, the housing market is more understood by the masses. And, and, and personally, I like to own things that everybody, everybody is either going to buy or everybody knows about because pr I mean, houses are a racket, right? We, we price things off of comparables. How much of a racket is that? There's no intrinsic value to nothing. It's what everybody else is trading at a hundred a square, 500 a square, right? It's all comps in your area, right? But and, I, there, I, and, and there are still buyers coming in and offering 40% less, even though the market is going up, even though, and, and I'm like flabbergasted because I've been in this business long enough and I'm like, you actually have the nerve to write that in a contract? <laughs> yeah. But, but for some reason, and it, Jake, you, you, you've always said it, you know, it, it goes, the market goes the way people think it's going to go, right? So there are obviously is a set of people out there, specifically buyers, saying it's going to go down and I'm not going to buy this high. Well, and then we create that happening because it takes one person to accept 40% off of all-time highs. That's Correct. the new comp, right? So then that's, that's the, the comp, comp. everybody right. goes off of. It lowers the entire value of the, the whole marketplace. And then everybody says, oh no, things are trading at 20% discounted, whatever it may be. Then everything starts trading there and it feeds our biases and keeps going. I, I did see one question that I wanted to answer. Exchange traded products to me are the most liquid. Exchange traded. So anything off of a centralized exchange, which would be stocks, options, futures contracts, um, even cryptocurrencies off of, I, I mean, they're not as good because they're not centralized exchanges, they're individualized exchanges more so because it's a decentralized market, but anything that has an instant sell button is nice. It's nice to own, especially nowadays because you can't, you can't sell a real estate portfolio overnight. I mean, you could, you could sign a contract overnight, but you can if you need cash, you know? And I, I think real estate is the best long-term holding to have hands down but it's, it's also too easy to get overweight in. And I'm, I'm having conversations with certain people who are losing empires because they can't make debt service payments because they don't have cash. And it doesn't matter how much equity you have if you can't get cash to pay the debt service to keep the asset, everything disappears. Now to clarify what I was saying about barterability, that is the exit strategy, not liquidity. For example, in the transaction that we were just doing with, um, I was working on a couple months ago, actually. It was a very, it was a luxury property in Miami, and the buyer would not, the seller would not take earnest money. He did take a twin-engine helicopter. Okay, they bartered for it, <laughs> and that's what they did. It was what the value was to him. It didn't matter about the appraisal because at that level, believe it or not, they were actually just playing to see whose was bigger at that point in time. Which, by the way. They both walked away from the deal, whatever, but it was still hysterical because that's what the game was about. It wasn't about the price of the, of the, of the asset. It was because someone wanted to control it 
from taking the other person to see how well they can make it happen. It was the barterability that gave him that option. It wasn't necessarily the value of it. So yes, you do have some liquidity. I, I'm not disagreeing with you on that, but barterability is its own skill set. Just like I barter relationships. It's that for me is my asset class that I personally invest in. That's what I'm good at. Real estate is something I'm trained in. Stock is something I can appreciate. The asset I'm good at is relationships. They're people, which is why everyone's here. So that's what I trade. That's what I have. And they're not liquid for me, they're priceless. That's why when I bring people together, they make magic happen. So when I'm, when I'm talking about assets, don't just think tangible, think of intangible. Think of how much this relationship or this connection would mean to you. Because when I look at deals with people, like if I was doing a deal with Josh, okay, I could look at doing one deal with Josh or I could look at having a lifetime of deals with Josh. Which one's gonna have more value? I could have the first one do and, and, and not make anything on it, but make sure he, he wins. And then from there, we continue to grow because we are building a relationship. Guess what? That for me is an asset. Is it something that they can put a tangible value on and you can raise your net worth on? No but it gives me wealth and what I find valuable and what I deem important. So therefore, if I need to go run away and get out of Florida for God knows what a reason, hey, Josh, I'm on my way, make room. He would, again, it's a value thing. It's what you put value in. For me, I do it with people. We do have a question on Facebook. Uh, Jake, what do you feel about, how do you feel about Tesla right now? Oh man, if you own it, been a nice ride right oh my gosh me and everybody else are just shaking our heads saying yes go go now is it going to keep going that's a better question i think today's rally is all these smaller term traders that are buying in first time because maybe you don't have two grand to buy a share i get it you know maybe you're starting off with a smaller account or trying to practice proper position sizing so right on go for it and I think a few people are like, hey, I only have $1,000. Today's the first day I can buy. It's up big. But I'm asking myself, like, I, I think on a fundamental basis, Tesla's completely overvalued. Oh, no question about it. It is grossly overvalued. It is priced. It is, it's priced to be the most profitable car company ever thought of. Plus, like, have the margins that is like 15, I think, percent a gross margin where Volkswagen, the, mo the largest business uh, automaker in the world, that is, runs on like an operational four or five. So we're pricing in a super like best case golden idea. And I think a lot of it is stemming from the idea that everybody loves Elon and what he's doing. You know, I'm a huge believer in the, um, his, his whole satellite program he's developing, Star, like, I think it's Starnet or close to that, Skynet. Uh, he's trying to work on that. All of his um, rocket technology, reusable engines as killer. His battery tech is going to change the world with renewable energy resources, being able to store things more effectively and efficiently. I think that's awesome. And right now, the only way we can buy him is buying Tesla. So if Elon dies, mm, I'm questioning my investment, just like my Amazon stock. If Bezos goes, I got to think about rotating out maybe. If that doesn't happen... The stock I own, I'm a long-term holder of. I like what he's doing. You know, you should have at least doubled your money this year on Tesla, in my opinion, unless you bought it like yesterday or two days ago, I guess. But like, it's up 11x. So if you caught 1x inside of that, it should have been pretty easy. Maybe take half off the table, let the other half run. I do that all the time with my stocks. You know, once it's free cash, just let them ride. Um, then you really don't care. I mean, if it goes to the moon, it's awesome. If it goes to zero, whatever. Uh, but I think it's all hype right now. The price action, it should not be. And notice this, guys. You notice how the day it was, the day it was breaking support is the day they announced the stock split. Coincidence? No. No, not at all. The moment that it's breaking through price floors is the day they announced, and then they've added, what, 170 plus billion in market cap since announcing a stock split, which does nothing except back-end financial math on the top of the table, it does nothing for the business. Like it, it's not better because of it. It's, it's all BS. But if you own it, I mean, you're making money. So why complain? So I, I think if you're, if you're in it, ride the wave. If you're not in it, pick your entries. Um, let me look at a chart today. I don't, I don't think today's your entry. Oh, well, today's a big candle. That's hard. Dang, it's already 500. I didn't know that. Um, 
Hmm. I don't know. It might be one of those events where you just have to hold your nose and buy. I, that the whole stock market's like that. You just can't think. You got to hold your nose and buy. Everything's running. Don't look at valuations and 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 be in it short term and then scale out of the position um, as as you see profit. I I would hope for a dip though. I would love it if Tesla dipped to three hundred a share, three fifty. I'd take three fifty. That that to me would be healthy. That to me would be normal. Are we going to see that? It's it's not looking likely. So, uh, Musk has some. There's a really great channel I to subscribe to on YouTube called um, Venture City. If you guys haven't looked at it, you should look at it. It's fantastic. They talk a lot about um, things that, that are coming in the future, different people's perspectives. And I just watched one about cities of the future from both the Bezos perspective and the Musk perspective. And uh, one of the creepiest things, guys, this is real cool. The reason why Musk says he's working so hard is because he thinks that the gap between artificial intelligence and human intelligence is too far apart. He thinks artificial intelligence is going to overtake human intelligence just because our output is so much slower. So there's going to have to be a way for us to merge our human intelligence with artificial intelligence so that we can actually have a fighting chance against AI. So he, um, there are so many cool things he talks about, like with hyperloops, uh, you will be able to get from, um, and what he's doing with rockets at SpaceX, they're not just going inter, interplanetary, they're going to go from here, like flights, they're going to take like commercial flights. You'll be able to go from Paris to New York in 30 minutes on a rocket. Kind of cool. I mean, these are all things that they have in this little documentary. But he also says, and this is really interesting, he said that, um, he believes that video games will become so realistic that you won't know which games are real and when you're in reality. So 40 years ago, it's only been 40 years, the most advanced game was Pong, which was two little posts and a ball going back and forth. Now look what we have. We've got games where you have millions of people can interact together. You got virtual reality simulations. It's crazy what you're able to do. So they're thinking that as technology advances, we're going to actually be in, be in video games are gonna feel so realistic. You cannot tell when you are in a video game versus reality, which begs the question, are we in one right now? I don't, don't even go down that rabbit hole, dude, because it's a slippery slope and you don't get out of the spiral. Because it was a really you'll great never know. Documentary. You'll never know. You can't you can't we'll tell if it's a simulation know. or not. Exactly. What <laughs> now, but that also Brent, well, there was something that made me think because I go to a different place when I have to hear those things. It doesn't bother me. I went on to um one of my my mentors who this is another mindset thing. You gotta also take care of your spirituality and your emotions when you're investing. Um, my mentor, Marilyn, who passed away a few years ago, um, rest in peace. She um she told me the story about, uh, and it's actually gone around. She was, it was an email about this man who passed, who passed away and he goes and he goes up and he's with God and uh, he died in a car accident. He had a daughter and a wife back home. And he asked, I was like, why did you take me away? He was like, it's, it's just time is how life happens. And he's like, what about my wife, my kid? He's like, they will, they will go on. And it, it was very like so on and so forth. He was like, they will go on. Now you're gonna be reborn into a life of a fourth century Chinese peasant girl. It's like, why? And God said, when you've lived every life, then you will be able to obtain enlightenment and you'll become one with me. It's a really interesting way of saying reincarnation. He said, well, what happens after that? He's like, I don't know. I haven't lived every life through this. Very interesting way of thinking about it. So when I think about this and how you're able to play different characters in these video games and so on and so forth, for me, I think of the way that you actually bring that, the way, I think merging human consciousness with artificial intelligence is a way of us obtaining another level of nirvana of consciousness and actually not necessarily because it's greater or worse, it's just another perspective. So I'm a nerd, I love string theory, I love talking about all this stuff and I'm gonna get way off, but I can think I, it's can really I jump on that real quick, Jacob? Sure. No one ever talks about it with me, so please do. Uh, well, I'm going to steer it left field here, bro. Um, <laughs> most people are never going to be in the position to build tech like that. They're not going to have the resources. They're not going to have the brain power. You know how it takes a lot to get a lot of, well, like the best minds in the world together to be able to kind of make these types of things happen. Mm -hmm. What I love about the stock market is the fact that you can put your capital behind something and fund an idea and be a part of it without actually having to build the infrastructure. 
right? So when people are investing in Tesla, you're a part owner, right? You don't have to go and syndicate all the brains. You don't have to go and, and raise the debt capital from investors. You don't have to go and lay the infrastructure. You can be a part of it without really being a part of it, which is cool, right? So you can go out and say, hey, I want to invest in the ideas that are going to make games the next thing where people aren't going to want to leave the game anymore. Can you do that on your own? Maybe, maybe not. But together, raising capital together, we can, which is really cool, you know? And if you guys want to talk more about these types of things, like how to, how to get started in that, shameless plug, stock market survival guide led by my, my uh, good friend and trading partner, Emily. Yep. I mean, at the end of the day, make sure you're there. If you don't know how to get there, Jacob's your man. He can show you how to get there. Uh, I'll be there. I'm, I'm just a fly on the wall to help out, get my thoughts. Um, but it's a way for you to be able to invest in the, because real estate's awesome. Housing is important, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily get my, get me as jazzed as what you're talking about. Right. You know, game changing ideas, connecting your brain to a computer. That's cool. We can do those types of things in other markets. So which is really interesting. I know it's, it's, it's just interesting to know if you just look at things differently when you start investing. It's so cool. It really is. So thank you for that plug. Uh, just also going on with that, we are going to be having Virginia Mack on on Wednesday. She is a luxury agent as well as one of the members of Four Ocean, which is a company that's made its mission to end global water pollution. So come on and get to know what she's got coming on. That'd be great. And we just lost Jake. So you'll be able to get to see her uh, and ask her questions to see what it's like to have a social mission with your work. It's very, very cool. Then we're going to have Frank and Sherry Calendario. They're finally making it. They're gonna to talk to them on Friday about what they've done with Kate's house and a little surprise about what they recently accomplished last week, which is why I was waiting for them to finish so we could finally have them on the show. So these are the two that helped me get started in my social housing project. And we're gonna talk more about that on Friday. Uh, Real Estate Survivor season two is going to be coming up here shortly autumn and you're going to make sure you're ready to go autumn so you guys can actually take this and build your business systems as well as your business credit and credibility autumn so you're going to have all that ready to go i'm not calling anyone out in particular autumn but if i am i want to make sure you're prepared for this okay autumn good so <laughs> uh, josh is going to be doing it too he doesn't know it yet but he is yep there you go uh-huh yeah. All right, guys, you are amazing. I've got more work to do. I'm sure you do as well. And I will see you guys later. Best of everything. Love y'all. Bye.